So uh, this podcast is about you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Okay. I love your room. Are you in a, your studio? Sort of. This is my bass player's studio, but this is where we do all our live streams. So we're like permanently set up for streaming. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Have you guys been doing a lot of live streams during this? Sort of. We, um, for most of it, we've just been, we were just doing one a month, but then um, with the new album coming out, I'm just kind of ramping it up and taking more stuff. So I've been streaming every day or two now. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Doing songs from the new record. Mostly um, this and that. So like I've done a couple interviews and like uh, video blog stuff. And then I'm also doing these little like surprise shows on my own Facebook. I'm running a cool. Kickstarter for the record. So I'm like, dropping in Facebook, doing a song and be like, it's available now, go to Kickstarter. So uh, <laughs> I love it. I've been doing those like every day. So I'm kind of like keeping everything plugged in to make it easier. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Well, uh, where are you originally from? Um, originally, I'm from rural Virginia, a town called Luray. Okay. What yeah. was that like? That was mostly bad. I mean, <sighs> I like my my young childhood was cool because we lived on like kind of not a working farm, but just like a big piece of land. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't go to school, so I kind of ran amok for my whole childhood. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Were you like homeschooled or something? I was homeschooled. We call it unschooling. So there's sort of like two camps with homeschooling. A lot of homeschoolers are like super Christian. So they're mm -hmm. homeschooling to keep their kids away from certain kinds of whatever influences or whatever yeah and my parents are like the other end of the spectrum they were like hippies who didn't want me, my spirit to be broken by, <laughs> by oh wow that's cool <laughs> my, so i was more like kind of got to study whatever i wanted and goof off for most of my childhood very cool how did you get into music were your parents into music my parents are both super into music but um they they both like dabble like they're amateur musicians i guess i should say um but right. we also like so my house growing up doubled as a retreat center my dad's a therapist and he did these like group therapy retreats um so they're just constantly like people in our house and we would be having parties all the time and um there was always always somebody in the house who was a musician i feel like <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. So you're always, always around it. Yeah. Yep. And then my parents are both just huge mu music fans. So we always had, you know, records on and my dad can play like 15 songs and they're mostly John Prine songs. And oh, okay. On guitar. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my dad's awesome. like a three chord guitar player, so he can get through most John Prine songs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. What was the first instrument you learned then? Was it guitar? I actually started on piano, um, but just like standard taking lessons. And then when I was, I think 13, I started playing guitar and um, started writing songs around the same time as well. Wow. With with the piano, were, was that something you were interested in or your parents want you to be, you know, learn learn some music? I don't even really remember. I, I was like five or six when I started lessons. So I think mm -hmm. probably my mom kind of plopped me down in piano lessons. And then um, I kept doing them, although I didn't really like piano <laughs> like, oh really <laughs> I'm, like, I'm glad that i know it because it's a, it's so much more useful to look at a keyboard to try and understand what chords you're right playing. i mean it's guitars like the foundation are, right for yeah. everything guitars are still like i i don't know a lot of music theory i'm very uh i have a very basic understanding and i still have a hard time figuring out what chords i'm playing on guitar but mm -hmm. if I transpose it to the piano then i'm like oh okay it's one of these sure oh that's <laughs> awesome well so at 13 you started writing your own songs Yes. Wow. Yeah. And then um, I moved away from home when I was 16 and I moved to the West Coast and I lived in this like group house with a bunch of other artists or a bunch of artists, I should say, because I was 16. I wasn't quite anything yet, but I was really mm -hmm. interested in music and um, moved out there, joined a couple bands. I was a backup singer in a funk band for a few months. That was my first tour. <laughs> when I was oh, you did a tour at 16? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Where did, did you do the whole country? No, it was like, so like, I don't know. I don't want to sound denigrating. It was like a tour of a random selection of dive bars in the West. <laughs> okay. That's so cool. I mean, that must've been a cool experience as a 16 yeah. year old. It was really cool. It was like, it, you know, it was, they were friends and we had fun playing music together and we all like jumped in a van and drove around for six weeks. We probably played like two weeks worth of shows in six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember like being 16, I was getting into all these bars and like 
getting free drinks and stuff. And I was just like, this is awesome. Like, no, right. here's that I'm not old enough to be in here. This is the coolest <laughs> job ever. And I like, didn't get paid. I don't think I got paid anything for being on that tour, which now I'm like, what the heck? But at the time I was like, this is great. Like, right. We had to like dumpster dive sometimes. Like it was, it was slim pickings, but it was really fun. And it still is really fun. I love that. <laughs> that's cool. That's really cool. So when you got back, you were, the, you were the backup singer in this band. I was one of two. Yeah. Okay. And, and Nicole, from, and she and I also had a band where we'd write our own songs. <laughs> oh, that, okay. So that was my next question. Did you also have your own band that you wrote, wrote the music for and, and how, how did yeah. that happen? <laughs> sort of. Yes. Um, so Nicole and I worked on songs. Our band was called the short skirts cause we were both really short. Um, <laughs> You didn't and, wear short skirts. It was no, because you're a short girl. Yeah, we were short. We were short skirts. So uh, <laughs> we wrote songs together and I wrote songs of my own. And then um, I, I just performed like open mics and stuff. I got I had like a gig at a pizza shop for a while. Um, so I just kind of from like my first gig, I remember being when I was 13. Um, and then just for the next like seven or eight years, I just kind of played whatever gigs I got and worked on songs. Um, and then I made my first record when I was 19. Oh, and, wow. Um, was that self-produced and self-released? Uh, yep. Yep. It was indeed. And then when I was like 20, 21, I moved to Philly. And at the time, like I had, I, on the West Coast, I like got together with a guy, had a boyfriend, we we're living together. And then like we broke up and I had one of those like this is my life things where I was like, I got to go to the East coast and try to make it in the music business. Sure. <laughs> so I was 21 and I moved to Philly and just like started playing gigs and trying to, you know, I had an album at that point. So trying to like hawk that album. And, um, I remember like, I still have a, like a word document from then where I was like, this is everything I'm going to do this year. And if I don't do it in the, this year, I'm going to quit music and do another job, do a real. Oh, job. wow. Very like, this has to work out. I'm not going to waste my life trying to make it. But then I just really liked it. So most did of the things still haven't happened. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, did you achieve everything on the list? No, I, did, I don't think I've achieved any of the things on the list. Maybe a couple. <laughs> <laughs> but I just was like, you know, it's just I got the bug. It's just a mm -hmm. really fun job. Now it's like, as long as I'm surviving, then I'm basically like, this is fine. <laughs> sure, sure. You can eat and you have a roof over your head. You're all, you're all good to go. Yeah, it's still the best job ever. Even in the pandemic, it's the best job ever, honestly. Like I'm having a better time than a lot of people because I just get to still play music with my friends. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's, that's I really cool. I think my cool. bar got lowered is what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's bar got lowered. Like, well, at least I can go outside and do something now or, you know. Maybe I'll be able to go to a show and stand 40 feet away from each other. <laughs> things, Or you have to be like, well, at least we have leftover cookies. So Right. There you go. <laughs> at least the Girl Scouts are delivering now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, well, so you had that record. You moved to Philly. And how long were you? Are you still in Philadelphia? I'm in Philly again. So I lived here for six or seven years and then um in that time I met my husband John and then we moved to New Orleans and then we lived in New Orleans for eight years and I just moved back to Philly in the pandemic oh uh, wow yeah. so when you moved to New Orleans were you obviously still putting out records yeah it was just it was one of those things where like I just I I had gone through New Orleans a couple times to play shows and I kind of like fell in love with it and um we just were like, well, like my husband quit his job and was working. He does like web development. So he was like, where do you want to live? And I was like, New Orleans. So we just kind of fucked off to New Orleans. And wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we, we just lived in New Orleans for a few years. And um, it's an amazing, wonderful city. But it also is a crazy place to live. Mm -hmm. um, and my family's up here and my band's up here. So it was like when the pandemic hit and I wasn't going to be on tour anymore, I was like, okay, I have to be close, physically close to those people because otherwise I'm not going to see them until who knows when. Sure. <laughs> so I actually moved in with my bass player and his wife at the beginning of the pandemic. And like we were supposed to start a tour. The tour got canceled. I was already at their house in Philly. And I was just like, Let me, I'm going to stay here for a little while so we can work on our new record. And then it was like six months I was in his house. <laughs> and you're like, actually, I'm not going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So you, when you moved down to, um, when you moved down to New Orleans, like, how, were you putting out records and, and touring? And like, was that kind of the cycle? Like, what was the next step? 
yeah. <laughs> it's like, I feel like whenever I talk about this stuff, it all is so hazy because I'm just like, I don't know. I just like, since I was 16, I've been just touring whenever anyone allows me to and making a record whenever I can scratch together the money. And that has been 15 years of my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> more, almost 20 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so I moved to New Orleans. The first thing I worked on down there, I made a jazz record. Um, all of my records except one are of originals, but I made a record called Not Old, Not New. Okay. Um, and I just, I love old like vocal jazz and mm -hmm. American popular song. Which is huge down in, in New Orleans too, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah and it was kind of like a convergence of things. Like I had been wanting to make the record for a while. And then when I moved down there, I kind of got hooked up with a scene of like really incredible jazz musicians, like a lot of these legend guys. And um, I was like, well, I want to make a jazz record. I love that music. So I like just kind of whipped it together. <laughs> like I ran a Kickstarter and that Kickstarter kind of took off. So I had like a bunch of money to work with kind of for the mm -hmm. first time. So I was able to hire just crazy, a crazy cast of people like Ellis Marsalis played on it and um, just a bunch of like New Orleans jazz dudes that are great. And how, how did that Kickstarter like you just put it up online or something and you were doing shows and kind of draw, driving people to the website. Like how did you gain, you know, that, that much support? Good question. Honestly, it was kind of the heyday of Kickstarter. Like I think I ran that in like 2014, maybe. Okay. Right. 2013 could have been 2013 probably. So it was like, I just kind of hit the peak minute where like there were a lot of people just surfing Kickstarter looking for stuff to support at that point. Wow. I remember like the whole month that my project was up, it was the only jazz project on Kickstarter. So anyone who had selected jazz as like a thing they were interested in was getting notifications <laughs> to like go. Oh. Kickstarter. So I think like more than half of the people who donated were new people that found me on Kickstarter. That is and awesome. It was like one of those weird, I always think like we talk a lot in the music business, people talk about getting big breaks. And I feel like, at least for me, there have been no big breaks, but there have been a lot of small breaks. It's mm -hmm. like that was a small break. Like I just randomly had like an extra 30 or 40 grand to work with because the Kickstarter website just like did that one time. Sure, sure. Like, you can't really plan for that stuff. And it's not even who you know. It's like way more random than that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, you can't. If you could plan that, everybody would be yeah. <laughs> successful, right? Yeah. And the record, like I did, the the concept of the kickstarter it was called jazz is for everybody and mm -hmm. i was basically like i'm gonna make a jazz record and i'm not a jazz musician and that's why you want me to make this record i i just like singing songs so i've like mm -hmm. picked some songs that you the person who doesn't listen to jazz are going to be able to understand and appreciate and it's not going to feel like too academic for you or like foreign or something mm -hmm. so i think people connected to that too i had a lot of backers that were like oh i my grandpa listened to jazz and i never got into it but i want to or whatever right right it almost was like a primer for people like like i wasn't pitching it to people that already like jazz <laughs> right right yeah you're pitching it to a new audience yeah. of, of people that's that's really cool well you talked about getting little small breaks i'm sure one of those was the Paul Simon shows yeah. that you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. That was also so like right soon after I moved to Philly, I met this guy, Bill Ibe, um, and he was a manager. He, he managed me for five years. And when I met him, he was like, he's kind of like one of these old school music industry guys. He's like he was in his, I guess, probably late 60s when we met. And he's like represented all these artists that went on to have big careers. And he had worked for record labels and stuff. Um, and he like saw me playing in some coffee shop in Philly and was just like, I'm going to help you. Um, and the main, like he talks about himself as being an artist development, which I feel like is a, is a management approach that doesn't happen very much anymore, but it used to be a right. big yeah, I was going to, the yeah. labels used to do that. Yeah. yeah. They would like send an A&R guy and find yeah. somebody you know, wherever, and yeah. then kind of try to develop. And now it's just, what is your streams on Spotify yeah. and how many TikTok we followers do you have? have. <laughs> yeah. So Bill was really great for me. And, and one of the main ways he helped me is he just like went to all of my shows, watched them and would like give me feedback in a way that I could hear. So he'd be mm -hmm. like, I think you should play this. I think you should not do that song anymore. Maybe your banter should, whatever. That was extremely helpful. Like, I think I probably would not be still in music if I hadn't had that experience. But the other thing he did that was really useful for me is he would take me to all these 
crazy huge shows and like take me backstage and have me meet people. And wow. he would always like, I was like 21, 22 at this time. And he would always like take me to a show. Like I remember one time he took me to a, a Bob Dylan show and we were like backstage and wow or whatever. And he was like, he like took me aside and he was like, I brought you here because this is where you belong. And that was always what he would say. He'd be like, I brought you here because this is where you are. This is who you are and, and you should be comfortable here. <laughs> uh-huh. That's cool. That was like part of his artist development approach was just like getting me comfortable hanging out with like famous musicians. Um, right. But that, I mean, that's even a thing in itself. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I mean, I've did radio for 15 years and I remember the being so green to it in the beginning, like, oh my gosh, I'm hanging out backstage and there's all these like super famous people or, or whatever. And you want to make sure you don't act like an idiot or, you know, say the wrong thing. Like, I mean, there's definitely an art so to speak to being able to put yourself in that position yeah Yeah, and I think for Bill it was also just like he wanted me to have confidence he wanted me to feel like Mm -hmm. I belonged and not like I was you know some internet like fanning out in there yeah Yeah. like you too are a great artist and that's why we're here with Paul Simon right (laughs) so uh yeah I got the Paul Simon shows it was just two shows um my bass player Joe same guy um did them with me so uh, Bill got me those through some guy that he used to work with who made yeah. Simon. So it was, was just- that those the biggest shows you had ever played uh, at the time? Yeah, biggest rooms? Still be the biggest. I think there were 5,000 seats. I don't think I've, yeah, those are still the biggest shows I've ever played. That was almost 10 years ago. Was that intimidating? Totally. Yeah, it was intimidating, but it was also like one of those things where that was right after I had decided to like be a professional musician. So I feel oh. like, I what? No. I think it was like 2012, 2011, maybe. So it was a couple years into it, but it was pretty soon after I had moved to Philly. Okay. And, and yeah, so I think in some ways, like if it happened now, it would seem more crazy. At the time, I was like, oh, okay, sure. I do <laughs> my job now. So I get to open for Paul Simon. That makes sense. <laughs> right, right, right. What do you remember what, what made you make that dis- choice? Like, okay, I'm going to be a professional musician. I mean, it sounds like when you got to LA at 16, that was kind of your. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, it was, it was Eugene actually. <laughs> Not oh, a, okay. But yeah, I mean, I knew that I was a musician start at least from that age. And I think I uh, had to warm up to the idea of doing it professionally. So like when I okay. moved back to Philly and I made that word document, it was kind of like, okay, I'm going to do this, but only if you know, only if I make this much money or only if I get to mm-hmm. play these size rooms or only if I sell this, this many records or whatever. So it was oh, like, right. Okay. I was trying to like, I was trying to make myself commit to it only if I was a certain amount of successful. Got it. And I enjoyed it too much to do that. <laughs> so sure. I kept, okay. No, I never became that amount of successful. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, well, okay. Well, I want to get back to this, the record on the Kickstarter. So you, yeah. you put out, um, not old, not new through the Kickstarter campaign and like with that were you able to to tour that record like what was the next little um yeah little victory you had yeah that record was interesting it was like it was a mixed bag I got a bunch of opportunities I hadn't had like through the Kickstarter I got to go tour Australia because I just had a bunch of like Australian backers that like wow up with another artist and I went and opened for her and I got to do that um and there was like a European tour as part of that too um but at the same time I, it was also my first chance to do a full band tour, but I didn't mm-hmm. have a band. I just had my bass player. So there was like, oh. there was some drama around like trying to put a band together and do this U.S. tour without like, we didn't have, we didn't have the basis of like having done shows together in a hometown. So I was mm-hmm. like trying to hire people. I didn't really know how to do it. It was like, it felt, it was fairly, it was a mixed bag, that tour. But it was a yeah. experience. And I did, one of the people I hired uh, is a keyboard player named Pat Firth. So he's still in my band. So oh, okay. I had all these people and we got one. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. You have the bass player and now a key, a keys. Yeah. <laughs> was and it hard to find people? I mean, how do you even do that? You just put like an ad up on Craigslist or something like looking for a band. So hard. I, it's still hard. I, I just ask people for recommendations. So like my, my friends in music, I would be like, do you know any drummers that are good? I'm still asking this question. We still don't have a drummer, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I would always just take recommendations, but again, it's like, it depends who you ask. And it also depends like your, the cocktail of personalities you have is so important that you can't mm-hmm. really predict who's going to work out in your band until you play shows or like go on tour together. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of things that seemed promising and then sort of crashed and burned or like fizzled out or whatever. Okay. 
and then well once you got back from australia did you did you have a band that you took to australia no those were just solo shows. okay when did you put the band together and what 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 uh where were you at when that happened that, that was just for the u.s tour so we did like 30 cities or something so we had like wow. a full summer of touring the u.s and we had like different bands and on different legs and it was like it was chaos it, but it did it taught me a lesson about um how to you know how to make everybody comfortable and like make the shows good while you're having to like have a lot more people involved because so i had done so much touring solo and then duo that i was like i was kind of like oh how hard can it be just get a couple more people like joe but again like joe's been in my band for 11 years and i have it's so hard to find somebody who's that like reliable and good and professional and right. fun to hang out with most importantly <laughs> exactly well and and so that u.s tour was on that same album that not old not new yeah and then um the following record was called so ferocious and uh -huh. and kind of the the band drama continued like we hired an, we did another full band tour for that record and it was like another cast of characters so it was like an ongoing saga <laughs> until just the last probably two or three years i think i kind of got better at figuring out how to hire band members <laughs> even with buckle up was that or buck up was that the same Buck Up, uh, we toured pretty much all with the same band, if I remember correctly. So Joe and Pat now are like lifers, as far as I'm concerned. They're in okay. the band. They're in the band. They're in the band. And like, we're, you know, we have a certain amount of commitment with each other and stuff. Mm -hmm. We had a drummer for most of the Buck Up touring named uh, Coco Dugas, who's a Canadian guy, which was its own thing because we had to like get him a visa and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, we had, we had a pretty solid band for that year as well. Um, although he's he's no longer in the band so it's sort of like if shows ever come back then we're back on the looking for a drummer tip oh okay the hardest to find i know i know that's why i bought my five year or four year old almost turning five year old son a drum kit uh yeah. electronic kit you can medium well and just not be a dick like you have a full life of professional yeah music. you can pick you the pick of the litter right i mean <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> well, with that, like, were were you finishing up the buck buck up tour when coronavirus hit? Like, where were you guys at when yeah. that all happened? Basically, so let's see. Buck up came out in February 2019. So yeah, we were just finishing that tour. We had we basically did a year of touring behind that album, and we had a run of shows scheduled for like february march april may of last year and okay so we did the february shows the last show i played in person was on march 1st oh wow yeah. were, was it in new orleans or were you uh, on the road yeah. that was the end of a west coast tour so the very last show i played was in portland oregon on march 1st <laughs> and, um, oh wow that was like the end of a run of like a week on the west coast and then we were about to do the east coast and the midwest and all that and um yeah, I flew to Philly to start the East Coast leg. And that was like the week that we started getting cancellations. I remember the day, actually, I was like on vacation in between the West Coast tour and the Philly leg. And like, I just got a call from my manager and she was like, okay, some things are canceling this one and this one. And then like that day was just like, felt like the world was exploding. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Because at that point, from all directions. Yeah. Did you know, I mean, at that point we, they, we knew that this, this thing was happening, right? Like yeah. this virus, did you see any, um, like, uh, like a drop in, in people like showing up their show, like say it was a sold out show and then only two thirds of the people, people came. Like, did you Not see any of that prior? I think just because like we, we ended our tour March 1st and I feel like between the first and like the 15th is when that started happening. Like people started getting freaked out. And I'll give you an example. We, for the last West Coast tour we did, I had like a part of the show where I had people hug each other. Uh huh. I was like, you're going to hug the person near you and whatever. It was like a, the whole audience participation thing. And everybody hugged each other at every one of oh, those shows. And like, interesting. And nobody actually at the like second to last show was the first time somebody didn't want to do a hug. And that was oh. the first time I was like, huh, that's weird. But it like, it was right. The timing didn't quite work. So we basically finished our tour as though everything was normal. That's interesting. Yeah, the last in-person interview that I did was speaking of Philly was with uh, G Love, oh, and yeah. and it was like right on the cusp. It was like the it went from the 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 knuckle like in hand instead of handshake to like the elbow. Yeah, and so it was like the elbow thing, and we were kind of like 
you know, yeah. halfway joking about it, like, oh, you know, coronavirus, whatever. Yeah. And then like days later, everything it was, was it was done. Yeah, it was gone. Even so then, like I'm I'm sure everybody's been saying this, but it's funny to think now, like when we rescheduled our March shows, we rescheduled them for May. So at the time we were right. thinking in a couple of months, we'll be through this. Like right. it all seems so crazy. Like, what did we think was gonna happen in two months? <laughs> but right. It was like when Coachella was like, you know what? We're gonna push it to October. Everyone's <laughs> like, oh, fall, that'll, that'll be cool. And I'm like, yeah. there's no way a hundred thousand people are getting together in <laughs> five yeah. months six months it doesn't make any sense Hope but eternal <laughs> yeah oh my so you were on vacation getting yeah. calls from your manager saying hey this yeah. is ending yeah and then yeah obviously that must have rocked your world quite a bit I mean, that's your livelihood right yeah and then i remember like i was on the porch at the vacation house talking to my manager and i was like okay here's what we're gonna do i'm gonna go to philly anyway even though the east coast tour is getting canceled because i had a flight to philly mm -hmm. i'm gonna go to philly anyway and we'll do a online show and we'll call it a rent party so i remember oh. it was like march 10th of last year it was probably exactly a year ago that we planned our first rent party and the rent party idea was literally i wanted to be able to pay the band's rent because at the time like they're both sidemen they're they don't have a job where they can do a live stream and ask for donations because they're not the front person of a band right there yeah exactly yeah like sidemen it's funny the way it's like this pandemic has made really clear what the like labor relations are in all these different areas mm -hmm. so like the labor relation in music is the front person gets to get paid like even by venues like joe can't do a gig by himself at a big venue and get money i have to get the gig and then i hire him to do the gig so like if you're a side man the calculus was went from i have the next six months of gigs planned out and i know i'm going to be able to make x amount of money to i have zero gigs and zero money like it was very right. Whereas yeah me, like i already had a patreon so i had some income that's oh that's good awesome. yeah i know a lot of artists had to had to jump to patreon yeah i've been on patreon for a long time which was super lucky um, but yeah, I, and even like streaming income, like it's not a ton of money, but I, as a songwriter and, and like a band leader, I have certain sources of income besides gigs. Mm -hmm. And if you're a side man, that's just not true. You have gigs and that's it usually. Right. Maybe. And even the crews that are doing yeah. the tours I mean, yeah. that are affected the, you know, the green day guys that yeah. go around and set up the stage and oh, drive yeah. the tour bus, like all those type of people um, are, are, we're all hurting. Totally. So, so that became clear at some point in March, cause I was talking to Joe and Pat and they were like, we have no gigs for the foreseeable future. We don't know what we're going to do. And I was like, all right, we're throwing a rent party. So I came here to Joe's house. We threw our first rent party and it was like March 27th or something of last year. And we got a ton of donations. And I think a lot of people have said this too, like the first one you did, the first uh, live stream everybody did and asked for money. It was like, it came flooding in. Cause everybody right was worried about us <laughs> you know? sure sure like when people used to bang the pots and pans because at the beginning we were like thank you essential workers and then it right like, off at some point <laughs> right yeah, exactly the essential workers are still there yet nobody's outside banging pots and pans for them anymore <laughs> so anyway the first rent party went really well and so we were just like all right we'll keep doing them so i've we've done one every month we're about to have our one year anniversary our 13th rent party at the wow. end wow um, and I have, we have managed to pay the band's rent every month. Um, oh, so that's the, incredible. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, even though the amount has fluctuated, we've still like pulled it off. So it's still a successful rent party. Um, so yeah, that's been what we did in the pandemic. Uh, and we also have made a record, um, which was like a whole other escapade. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about that. So the new record love and rage was, yeah. were these songs written, uh, pre COVID, uh, during the pandemic? Tell me, tell me yeah. about this. They were about half written um, when right. the pandemic hit. So I started writing in summer 2019. And what's interesting is that they were all about like apocalypse and like the feeling of impending doom. <laughs> <laughs> so, like the first song I wrote for this record is called Party at the End of the World. And I wrote. Oh, and you wrote that before coronavirus was a thing? Yeah, which is only funny because it's like, I think a lot of people can relate to this. It's like the the feeling that we're coming up on something that's going to be like, that's going to make society collapse. That's been around for a while. So like uh -huh. coronavirus just accelerated what was on, yeah, right. which is right. like, all of this is not sustainable. How are we going to pull this off for the rest of my life, let alone my kid's life? Like we've all felt that way for a long time. It's uh -huh. not like everything was hunky dory until coronavirus hit. Right, right, exactly. 
so yeah I already had started writing on that theme and then when COVID hit it was just like okay I guess I'll stay with this like keep writing these songs so the love and rage songs are like they're about you know all those emotions we've all been going through a lot of Mm -hmm. anxiety and feeling like the world's ending but then also a lot of like love and feeling like oh people are really getting together and making stuff happen We, we were in my band pretty involved in the summer protests and so there's some protest songs on there as well okay and even the photo is from one of those, right? Yeah. The record cover. Yeah. Yeah. So the album cover um, is a photo of two people lying on the ground on like concrete with masks. Uh-huh. Um, and that was taken at one of the Philly protests in last summer. Oh, wow. Where there was like one of the early George Floyd protests. They had everybody lay down for eight minutes and 50 seconds or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a photo from 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 that event. Yeah. Yep. Oh, wow. So album cover there by a guy called Isaac Scott who just took photos at all the protests. Um, we weren't at that one, but we were at I don't know six or eight other protests in Philly. Philly was going pretty hard last summer. Um, really? Yeah. And there's one of the other album photos. I think it's going to be the back cover. Um, is of a bunch of people climbing over a fence, getting tear gassed. And oh wow! That protest became kind of famous in Philly because uh they just they really fucked up like they there's all this footage of how the police kettled people and gassed them and started arresting people putting them in unmarked vans and stuff and (sighs) the city had to apologize and there's like multiple class action lawsuits going on the mayor apologized and the police commissioner resigned and stuff so the protest became this like kind of linchpin event around here Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah so uh all that stuff is is uh makes a kind of a soup in this album <laughs> okay okay where were you recording it was that were you able to record it where you're sitting right now or uh how did that work i mean logistically with yeah the studios being closed yeah so we attempted to record it from joe's house where i was where i had quarantined with my bass player and uh i bought a bunch of gear and like learned to use pro tools right at the beginning we had we had connected already with our producer his name is tyler chester Mm -hmm. Um, so we already had plans to make a record this past summer um, but we were gonna like all go to El Paso and do it in a studio and live there for a week and whatever and all that obviously was canceled so at first Mm -hmm. I talked to Tyler and he was like listen get Pro Tools get this interface I'll sign you into my account and teach you how to use everything so for the for like May and June of last year I was like really trying to learn how to be (laughs) a recording engineer a producer (laughs) yeah yeah, it's funny actually because Tyler was still producing. We would do these Zoom sessions where uh-huh. I would like record something, send it to him on Pro Tools. He would listen and he'd be on Zoom and be like, okay, try another take, but do it like this. So it was like, oh, we he's still like <laughs> yeah, he was still be able to do it, but virtually. Yeah. But the issue ended up being just like really dumb gear stuff. Like I basically couldn't get high enough quality stuff, or there's like electrical interference or like, the tone isn't quite right and it's so hard to like do mic placement properly or whatever. So we used some of the tracks that we recorded here, but mostly we ended up re-recording them in person in LA. So uh, okay. in September, Joe and Pat and I drove all the way to LA from Philly. Wow. <laughs> went to Tyler's studio and finished the record because Tyler had already had COVID. So we like went and joined his pod and uh, did a did a recording session. Whoa. That, that Was that drive? pretty interesting i mean i just moved my family and i just moved to nashville oh wow um from san diego california and we just did the like six day across country drive um but i'm sure earlier in the pandemic was it hard to like pull over use the restroom like tell was it that must have been a totally different animal to (laughs) yeah it was um (laughs) we camped so we brought all our camping gear and okay that makes it a bit easier yeah, but we still like we would go into grocery stores and buy food and then cook it on a camp stove. So our exposure was a little higher, but we were pretty safe considering. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. We all were like, well, if we drive out and we camp every night and we only go to grocery stores every other day, then maybe we could do it safely. And mm-hmm. I think we, I mean, we felt pretty good about it. We had like our wet wipes in the car and our masks and all that. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Very cool. Well, so you, you make it, you record it in LA? Yeah, so we recorded mostly in LA. Um, still, a lot of the tracks are were long distance though, so a lot of the players did not come into the studio, but we sent them the tracks we were making in the studio so they could record on that from home. And then they would send it back to you. Yeah, yeah. The Do only you think- 
who joined us live other than Tyler, our producer is Griffin Goldsmith, the drummer. Um, he's in the band Dawes and he's a good friend of Tyler. So he like just agreed to come and wear a mask and do in-person stuff with us. And we had like a drum isolation booth too. So it made it a little, little safer. Yeah. Wow. Do you think that the record would have turned out differently if it was everybody in the room together or no, even though it was all virtually? I'm sure it would have been different. What's funny is like, we still got a lot of live sound because with the four of us, like with Griffin, we were able to track three or four of the songs live. Mm -hmm. um, and then what the other, the thing that was better about it is that we got some people that I don't think I would have gotten if we weren't in the pandemic. <laughs> so just oh, okay. everyone's home and no one's on tour. It was right. like easier to get people to play on my record. Like I just, we like set out some, some cold calls where I was like, who knows if Pete Thomas is going to actually do this. And he was just like, sure. What yeah. I'm, I'm sitting around anyway. Right. Yeah. So we had like a lot of real dreamy uh, personnel on this record that I don't think I could have gotten in a regular year. <laughs> That's amazing. Sorry. My son just walked in here. No problem. <laughs> well, um, incredible. And you've, you've put out one song. Oh, how many songs from the record have you put out so far? Just Two the songs. one. Two songs. So our first single was be good. That came out in January and the uh -huh. Single is shit list and that came out just last week yeah okay i saw that one come out and i and i and i listened to it prior to, to doing this um uh what what made you choose those as the kind of first two songs from the record yeah well we wanted to do a love and a rage song oh that makes sense there <laughs> yeah. you go so be good is sort of one of the most lovey songs the the refrain is be good to the people you love and love everybody alive mm -hmm. it's sort of like a big feel good you know loving song and then shit list alternatively is a song i wrote about nazis or neo -Nazis, oh, wow say so um <laughs> so <laughs> that's the rage one I'm trying to get there them you go yeah and then, and then is the the record coming the record coming out and it's coming out march 22nd right in a couple of weeks from now april 30th oh april 30th <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well and and between the two, between then, are you going to be putting out more an, another couple of singles in that kind of love rage? Probably not, actually. I okay. think we're just going to uh, drive towards the actual release from here. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Um, I might have another video coming out before then, but yeah. So Be Good and Shitless are out, and I have the Kickstarter going on until the end of this month. Um, and, then, and the next month is the album. And then another uh, rent rent show or? Yep, every month. Yeah, March 27th is the next rent party. And then the end of April, there's one that's like our album release party, quote unquote. Oh, uh, awesome. <laughs> that's going to be, uh, are you going to be able to, to you think, um, with the album release, have like a your full band or is it just still just going to be kind of stripped back? Well, me and Joe and Pat are the full band right now because <laughs> uh -huh. we don't Drummer, but we're not going to bring in a new drummer or anything until oh, okay yeah but yeah we've been doing most of them as a trio that's it's awesome pretty well and it is it's so much harder to do a live stream sound with a drummer so it's sort of like a blessing okay. <laughs> yeah yeah in quarantine very cool well thank you so much Carsey, for talking with me today i really appreciate it my pleasure thanks for having me yeah i have one more question for you i want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists Okay. Yeah. My advice for aspiring artists is that your creativity is the most important relationship you have in your life. Your relationship with your muse is the important one. So whatever happens in the business and whatever happens in your personal life is less important than cultivating that relationship with your own creativity. That's what will actually make you happy and nothing else will. 